Thank you for coming to the organizational meeting of the Trade Subcommittee for the 114th Congress. We will keep the organi organizational meeting brief so that we can begin uh, this afternoon's hearing as soon as we are done. First, I'm honored to be able to serve as the chairman of the Trade Subcommittee and uh, the first uh, member of the Washington delegation, uh, Washington State delegation to serve uh, in this position. Trade is very important to Washington State. I think as most everybody knows, we're the most trade dependent state in the country. So uh, double honor there. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the members on my side of the aisle. Devin Nunes, who is, is not present at the time from California, Adrian Smith of Nebraska, Lynn Jenkins of Kansas, Charles Bustani of Louisiana, Eric Paulson of Minnesota, Kenny Marchant of Texas, Todd Young of Indiana, Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania, and Pat Meehan of Pennsylvania. And we have Pat Tiberi and George Holding from the full committee sitting in on today's hearing because they are uh, very interested in this topic um, and we're happy to have them uh, with us today. On my left, uh, we have the ranking member of the subcommittee for the 114th, Co 14th Congress, Mr. Rangel of New York. And Mr. Rangel, would you like to introduce your team? Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, congratulate you and tell you how much I've enjoyed working with you on other subjects. I look forward to seeing what possibilities uh, remain in this session to get some concrete work done in the area of trade. I'm fortunate to have a strong team on this side, Richie Neal, who is well known nationally, as well as his work on the committee uh, from Massachusetts, Earl Blumenau from uh, the sovereign state of Oregon, Mr. Trade himself, Ron Kind of, <laughs> of Wisconsin, uh, Pete Pasquale of uh, New Jersey, and Lloyd Doggett of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. I look forward to working with you and, and the rest of the team here. Um, hopefully, this won't be the first hearing that the Trade uh, Subcommittee has. Uh, we'll be working on some other ideas as, uh, as we move forward, but we're excited to be here today, obviously. I'd like to also introduce our subcommittee staff. Angela Ellard is our Chief Trade Counsel and Staff Director for the Trade Subcommittee. And I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Steve Clays, Trade Counsel, uh, Nassim Fusel, uh, Trade Council, Josh Sneed, Trade Council, and Paul Guaglianone. And with that, after I pronounce that last name, the committee is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> I got through that one okay, right? Okay. Um, the coalition, uh, he's the coalition's coordinator for the committee, and I invite Mr. Rangel to introduce his staff as well. I look forward to working with your uh, staff and uh, Jason Kearns, it takes me, I'll take this opportunity to thank him uh, for the great work he's been doing for the subcommittee and the full committee. He's the chief trade counsel, working with Catherine Tai and Kagan Mull. And I hope that uh, we can at least find some issues with the members. I know Mr. Kelly and I, did he leave? No, we'll find something that we can get some bipartisan issue out of this committee. We've got to try hard to do it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rangel. I, I would like to comment briefly on the agenda for the subcommittee for the rest of the year. I expect that the subcommittee will continue the bipartisan work that we are showcasing today on a process for consideration of the miscellaneous tariff bill in a manner that provides tax cuts for our manufacturers, uh, manufacturers and is consistent with House rules. The subcommittee also will continue to analyze the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement to see if it complies with the requirements of TPA. We will continue our oversight um, of the TTIP negotiations, ongoing negotiations for the Trade and Services Agreement, the Environmental Goods Agreement, bilateral investment treaties, and other bilateral and multilateral relationships, including the World Trade Organization. The operation of the U.S. preference programs will be another important focus, as well as our oversight over trade adjustment assistance and all of the agencies in our jurisdiction. Last but far from least, we will ensure that the new trade facilitation and enforcement law, which was recently enacted, is implemented thoroughly and consistently in keeping with the intent of Congress. Like my colleagues, I want to be sure that the United States is facilitating legitimate trade while strictly enforcing all trade rules 
using these new trade tools as well as the ones already on the books. And Mr. Rangel, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome uh, to all of our witnesses. I look forward to hearing your testimony. The miscellaneous tariff bill uh, helps our manufacturers and workers to compete in the global economy. Our manufacturers have relied on MTB provisions that expired years ago and are currently facing higher costs. That would be problems in any environment, which are really difficult uh, uh, at this time. Uh, these companies deserve the support that MTB provides to help their workers on payroll and to add more workers. Uh, we hope that uh, the jobs uh, that are supported by the, this legislation it does not come at the expense of other jobs. I'm glad that we finally developed a bipartisan, bicameral solution uh, to this process, and I look forward to working uh, with the committee. This bill has the support of large business organizations, such as the National Association of Manufacturers and the United States Chamber of Commerce, and it also has the, small, the support of small and medium-sized enterprises as demonstrated by each of the witnesses we have with us today. So it's a modest but important bill, and I, I uh, conclude my opening remarks. Look forward to hearing the testimony of the manufacturers on our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. On a procedural note, as in years past, the subcommittee will operate under the same rules as the full committee. The chairman and ranking member of uh, their or their designee will each make an opening statement before we hear from the witnesses and other members uh, may submit written sta uh, statements for the record. The chair intends to require both witnesses and members to uh, adhere to the five-minute rule for testimony and questioning the following. And following the Gibbons rule, members who were here for the opening gavel will be recognized first in order of seniority. On occasion, other members of the committee may join us as is an example of today. Uh, for our hearing. Uh, does anyone on, on the uh, dais have any questions uh, on process matters? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Is that Mr. Rangel. Five-minute rule or the three-minute rule? Five-minute rule today, uh, we will have three minutes. But generally speaking, we'll have five. But today, votes may be called, so uh, we'll have three minutes each today. Very good. Uh, I thank our members for attending the meeting today and look forward to working with each of you for the remainder of Congress. With that, our organizational meeting stands adjourned. Uh, moving on to today's hearing. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks for uh, being patient while we move through uh, the rules of our, our committee. Uh, appreciate your patience. Uh, the subcommittee will come to order. We, uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee hearing on the miscellaneous tariff bill. Before hearing from our witnesses, I'd like to make a few points. Since 1982, Congress has considered bipartisan legislation to temporarily suspend or reduce tariffs on certain imported products and make technical corrections to US, uh, U.S. tariff laws through legislation known as the Miscellaneous Tariff Bill, or as we'll refer to those as MTBs, because miscellaneous tariff bills is a mouthful. The MTB is designed to boast, uh, to boost the competitiveness of American manufacturers by lowering the cost of imported inputs and in some cases finished goods without harming domestic firms that produce competing products. Just as companies in my home state of Washington have relied on MTBs, I know that many of my colleagues will share stories from their own districts. Our manufacturers have used the savings from past MTBs to strengthen their competitive edge, support the creation of domestic manufacturing jobs, increase U.S. production, and contribute to the economic growth of the United States. But since the last MTB expired in 2012, American manufacturers of all sizes have been hurt because there is no process in place to cut their costs and help them compete. Beyond dollars, the expiration of the MTB has cost our manufacturers domestic jobs and undermined their competitiveness. We owe it to our manufacturers and to the economic health of the United States to find a solution, and I believe we have. I'm very pleased that the ranking member, Mr. Rangel, and so many of our colleagues 
have joined with Chairman Brady and me yesterday in introducing legislation to establish a bill to strengthen the MTV process. Our bill delivers a regular, predictable legislative process for the temporary suspension and reduction of tariffs that helps our manufacturers and their employees. And it is also consistent with the rules of the House and upholds our strong ban against that word we all love to hear, earmarks. The process will begin by having our companies petition the Internal Trade Commission instead, International Trade Commission, excuse me, instead of having individual members of Congress introduce bills. It will be a model of transparency. It gives the American people the ability to see the whole process all the way through. And at the end, we will fully comply with the publication requirements in the House rules. I'm very pleased that our solution has such strong bipartisan and bicameral support and makes good on the commitment made by the conferees on the customs bill to find such a solution. And I'll again yield to Mr. Rangel if he has any further statements that he'd like to make before we go to the witness testimony. No, Mr. Chairman, I'm anxious to hear from the witnesses. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. The first witness that we have with, with us today is uh, Mr. Lieb uh, Omig, President and Chief Operating Officer for Glen Raven. Our second witness is Mrs. Don Grove, Ms. Don Grove, Legal Counsel for Karsten Manufacturing. Our third witness is Ms. Brooke D. Dominica, cr close enough, <laughs> D. Dominico, Production Manager for, Nas for National Ford, um, Nation Ford Chemical. Our fourth witness is Mr. Matt Schreiner, uh, global leader of Gore-Tex Footwear Innovation at WL Gore and Associates. Before recognizes, re recognizing our first witnesses, let me note our time is limited, so please limit your testimony to, to five minutes, and we're going to ask the members to adhere to a three-minute rule today, as I said earlier, uh, instead of the five-minute rule because of a possible uh, vote. So, Mr. Uh, I make. You have five Chairman, minutes. Chairman Reichert, Ranking Member Rangel, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to appear before you today as the subcommittee considers miscellaneous tariff bill reform and the economic benefits of providing tax cuts on imported products that are not available in the United States. I serve as President and Chief Operating Officer for Glen Raven Incorporated. Glen Raven is headquartered in Glen Raven, North Carolina, where the company was originally founded in 1880 and today remains under the same family ownership as its founder. Glen Raven employs more than 2,700 associates globally, with approximately 75% of those associates located in the United States. We operate five manufacturing facilities in North and South Carolina, along with 12 distribution facilities in 11 states. Innovation has been a driving force throughout our company's history. For instance, Glen Raven is credited with the invention of pantyhose in 1958, the innovative use of geotextiles for building roads across America, and finding new ways textiles can bring clean water around the world. Today, Glen Raven is most well known for its Sunbrella brand of fabrics. The Sunbrella brand covers a family of performance fabrics for the furniture, shade, marine, and automotive industries. Our Sunbrella portfolio of products drives innovation throughout the industry and supports thousands of U.S. jobs in research and development, design, and manufacturing. The essential raw materials for Sunbrella are solution dyed acrylic fibers. These fibers ceased to be available in the United States in 2005, so Glen Raven now imports these fibers and pays a 4.3% duty or tax on the value of these imports. These taxes make us less competitive in the global marketplace where we are already confronting, uh, confronting tremendous headwinds, including slowing global economic growth, currency challenges, and a rapidly changing regulatory environment. Solution dyed acrylic fabrics are highly technical in that the coloring occurs during the manufacturing process for these fibers. Therefore, the color actually becomes part of the polymer. In traditional textiles, fibers, yarns, or fabrics are dyed after they are manufactured, and as a result, the color is only on the surface. The net effect is that solution dyed acrylic fabrics are created from yarns fully permeated with color versus only having color on the surface. Sun, wear and tear, even bleach will not affect the color or performance of Sunbrella fabrics. 
In order to sustain Glen Raven's position as an industry leader and driver of innovation, we must have competitive access to these essential fibers, which are simply no longer produced in the United States. In the past, Glen Raven has effectively addressed the 4.3% import tax on acrylic fibers through the enactment of MTBs. Since the expiration of the last MTB in 2012, import taxes on acrylic fibers have cost Glen Raven millions of dollars that otherwise would have been invested in new jobs, research and development, design, and other innovative activities. Further, when you consider the pro productivity cost to the U.S. economy, the impact is substantial. According to a study by the National Association of Manufacturers, since the expiration of the last MTB, U.S. companies have faced a $748 million annual tax hike on manufacturing and an almost $1.9 billion economic loss to the U.S. economy. As I mentioned earlier, U.S. companies are already facing tremendous headwinds as we strive to compete in a global economy. A $748 million annual tax hike on raw materials and intermediate products that are not even produced or available in the United States is simply unwarranted. In closing, I know the subcommittee and the Ways and Means Committee have long recognized the need and justification for MTB. On behalf of Glen Raven and our associates, I thank you for recognizing the importance of the MTB, but also urge you to move forward with a new and reformed process that will provide a level, level of certainty and predictability. Most companies make investment decisions on a five to 10 year horizon. For a medium sized company like Glen Raven, when there is uncertainty about whether taxes will impose on our raw materials or whether there will be a process to provide us with relief, it significantly complicates our decision making regarding where to invest and produce our fabrics. I hope Cong Congress will work exp expeditiously in a bipartisan and bicameral manner to pass a new MTB process. I know for Glen Raven, this is one of the most impactful actions Congress can take to spur investment and job growth. Thank you for the opportunity to present these perspectives. I'll be happy to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Ms. Grove. Thank you, Chairman Reichert, Mr. Rangel, members of the House Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee, congressional staff and guests. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and tell you how the miscellaneous tariff bill really does encourage and preserve U.S. manufacturing and can even create it. Uh, I am Mrs. Dawn Grove, been married to the love of my life for 21 years, um, and I'm corporate counsel with Karsten Manufacturing. Uh, we're the parent company of Ping and Foundry Dolphin. Ping is one of the top three golf equipment brands in the U.S. Uh, we have 831 employees in Arizona, and we have been making premium custom fit golf equipment there for the past 57 years. The company was started in my grandfather's garage. And um, we love the idea of making things in the USA. Uh, six, nearly 60% of our workforce has been with us for 10 years or more, and 30% with us for 20 years or more. I've only been there 18 years, so I'm a relative newbie. Um, we're very excited that uh, several of our ping golf Pros may be um, selected for the U.S. and other countries' Olympic teams when golf returns to the Summer Olympics in Rio. So Karsten Manufacturing is the only major golf equipment manufacturer that has its own foundry in the U.S. And we used to be able to source our club heads from a number of different foundries, but those have since left the U.S. and fled for more business-friendly shores. Uh, we do still maintain our foundry, we do cast club heads, we have bought titanium furnaces to try and cast titanium club heads as well, even though that's not done anywhere else, but we simply cannot meet our demand or do that in a globally competitive way on a regular basis for the majority of our product. We do assemble the majority of our product and design it all in Arizona in the U.S. Um, we had no choice but to source certain components and certain club heads from other countries in order to protect the jobs that we have in Arizona and the families that depend on our employees. And as much as we have a passion for making premium custom fit golf equipment with quality and innovation and fabulous service, we also have a passion for doing so in the USA. Most every other golf equipment manufacturer has sent their production of golf clubs abroad. And you might wonder why that is. And one of the reasons 
is the tariffs and the way they incentivize that. Uh, unbelievably, the U.S. golf equipment manufacturers are faced with a higher tariff rate to bring in a component part than we are to bring in the whole golf club. And so the industry has responded accordingly. Why does our federal government penalize us in this way? Uh, we don't know. I don't think it was intentional. There are mistakes that happen in the harmonized tariff schedule. Um, but I understand that it's very difficult to fix. And it even takes an act of Congress to do a miscellaneous tariff bill for a temporary fix. So passage of the miscellaneous tariff bill is not simply a special deal for us or others, actually not that at all in the golf industry. It's rather uh, a way to help end the punishment for manufacturing here rather than abroad. So we literally have an inverted tariff, higher percentage rate for the component than we would pay to bring in the whole club. And if you could just allow me to tell you a quick story of how the MTB actually worked to bring manufacturing to the US, we have for decades built our golf carry bags that uh, hold the golfers' clubs um, in the US, but at some point we realized that because the bag flats were not available here, and even though our bags were quite successful, we could not globally, globally compete in bags without taking it elsewhere. And so in the late 1990s, with lots of tears and consternation, we opened a bag manufacturing plant in Mexico. At some point, another golf bag manufacturer requested an MTB to take that 7% tax, that tariff on the golf bag flat, down to zero. Well, we are always looking for a way to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. And when we saw that, we thought, that's the difference that could be made and we could do it in the U.S. again. And so literally, we closed our bag manufacturing plant in the U.S. and we trained workers in Arizona to make our bags there and we have done it ever since. Now, that tariff has gone back up to 7%. So we've literally moved our whole production to another area and done all sorts of things to um, lessen the cost. It's very challenging and it would mean a great deal to us if you are able to shepherd this across the finish line and get that MTB passed. Let my family know that you appreciate our commitment to the U.S. and that you care about manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and we do hope this moves uh, quickly. There'll be a, a markup uh, next week, so that's the next step in the process. So progress is, is, is happening. So uh, with your help and, and your input, um, we appreciate uh, your support and your testimony today. Uh, Ms. D. Domenico, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Reichert, Ranking Member Rangel, and fellow committee members. My name is Brooke D. Domenico. I'm a chemical engineer and a production manager at Nation Ford Chemical. We are a specialty chemical manufacturer located in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I'm here on behalf of my company, along with other domestic manufacturers, and ask for your support in passing a revised process to allow manufacturers to petition for the removal of import tariffs on items not available to us from domestic sources. We are active members in both the National Association of Manufacturers and the Society of Chemical Manufacturers and Affiliates, both of which also support passing the miscellaneous tariff bill. NFC is a small, family-owned chemical producer. We've been in business for over 35 years and employ approximately 100 individuals at our facility. My plant produces products that impact the daily lives of Americans in countless ways, ranging from intermediates that are consumed in the USA to productions of dyes that are used to color the food you eat and brighten the paper you write on, as well as a variety of other specialty chemicals, plastics, and naturally derived products that are sold both here and abroad. NFC is the sole domestic producer of colorants for the M18 smoke canisters used by the US Army and PANA, an additive used in jet engine lubricants that is literally in every jet air aircraft flying today for both military and commercial use. If NFC were no longer in business, these products would be manufactured and import from, imported from the Far East. As a toll manufacturer, many customers rely on NFC to make over 100 specialty products that are only made at our plant. Many U.S. companies have shut down because of unfair competition from the Far East. The MTB is one step to help level that playing field. NFC, by necessity, must import some of the chemicals we need to support our production. Prior to the expiration of the previous MTB in the end of 2012, 
NFC has historically filed requests for several raw materials to be included in the MTB. The elimination of these duties has a large impact on the ability for our company to compete against imported goods. We currently spend over $100,000 annually on these duties, which is money that would have been reinvested in the company for growth and job creation. Domestic manufacturing as a whole has faced an annual tax hike of almost $750 million and over $1.8 billion economic loss to the U.S. economy, according to an analysis done by the NAM. One specific example for us is the import of Dianil, which is a raw material used to manufacture a purple pigment at our facility. The pigment, called Violet Pigment 23, is manufactured at our plant in Fort Mill, South Carolina, under a toll agreement for Sun Chemical. Because of the expiration of the MTB, up to $600,000 annually will be paid in duties on Dianil alone. Since Sun Chemical purchase the, purchases the raw material, this impact is in addition to the $100,000 I referenced for NFC purchased raw materials. Therefore, the higher import duties affect not only NFC, but also Sun Chemical and their downstream customers. This product has a very low profit margin, and the addition of these duties has made it even harder for us, the only domestic manufacturer of this important colorant, to compete against imported Violet Pigment 23. The elimination of the tariff on imported Dianil would allow NFC and Sun Chemical to be more competitive with Violet Pigment product that is currently being imported from foreign producers. This imported volume could all be manufactured domestically at our plant if we were able to lower the price. Since the MTB is only applicable to materials that are not manufactured domestically or available in sufficient quantities, it would not have a negative effect on domestic manufacturers. The MTB package, considered by Congress in 2010, was estimated to support 90,000 domestic manufacturing jobs, increase U.S. production by $4.6 billion, and expand U.S. GDP by $3.5 billion. NFC, therefore, strongly urges the Ways and Means Committee to support the miscellaneous tariff bill. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your tes testimony today, Mr. Uh, Schreiner. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on this important trade topic. My name is Matt Schreiner, and I'm the global leader for Gore-Tex Footwear Innovation at WL Gore & Associates, headquartered in Newark, Delaware. I've been at Gore for more than 20 years, and currently I'm responsible for new product development and innovation globally for our Gore-Tex footwear business. Introduced in 1978, Gore-Tex technology revolutionized outerwear and footwear that could be both durably waterproof as well as breathable. For the first time, outdoor enthusiasts could be completely protected from the elements without having to endure sauna-like conditions inside of their jackets and shoes due to the buildup of heat and humidity. We're a privately held company founded in 1958. We employ approximately 10,000 associates worldwide. 6,000 of those are uh, working in the United States. Our products find application in a wide range of industries, including electronics, military and consumer apparel, medical devices, and polymer processing. We're a proud member of, of the National Association of Manufacturers, who is leading industry efforts supporting MTB process that will benefit manufacturers like us. We're also active in the OIA, AAFA, FDRA on trade issues, including matters relating to MTBs. Clearly, MTBs are extremely important to all four groups. Virtually all of the thousands of products Gore makes are based on just one material, a versatile polymer material known as EPTFE, which we engineer to perform a wide variety of functions. In our Gore-Tex fabrics products, we create these polymer membranes in one of our Maryland facilities, which we subsequently laminate to textiles. These rolled good composites are eventually built into the finished apparel products, including outerwear and footwear. We sell our laminates and other functional components like seam sealing tape and gaskets to some of the world's most well-known outdoor brands, including Brooks, Danner Lacrosse, Marmot, Merrill, The North Face, Outdoor Research, Saucony, Wolverine, and Under Armour. Collectively, Gore and these partners create valuable innovation and technology that allows outdoor enthusiasts to enjoy their favorite outdoor activities. As a company and a brand, the success we've enjoyed to date derives from the ex extensive investments we make here in the United States principally within our Maryland and Delaware campuses. It is here that we combine the essential ingredients of value creation in our products, such as fundamental materials R&D, product design and development, process engineering, prototyping, testing, and market research. 
Even though the assembly of our footwear is done internationally, the highest value is created in the U.S. and resides principally in our membrane, which is manufactured in Maryland. Performance footwear providing protection against the elements using coated or laminated textile fabrics, such as Gore-Tex fabrics, is subjected to duty rates as high as 37.5%. By comparison, the average consumer good has a duty rate of only 1.3%. Across the value chain, these tariffs pose significant economic disincentives for us, our customers, and footwear retailers, and they effectively narrow the choice and access of the U.S. consumer to the most technologically advanced footwear available. By contrast, consumers in other parts of the world are not subject to this onerous tariff, allowing them to purchase at a much lower price a broader range of innovative products designed in the U.S. by American workers. The MTB process greatly reduced these economic barriers and allowed the market to reflect the consumer demand for waterproof and breathable hiking boots and shoes. Brands added our technology more broadly across their product lines and footwear retailers sold a wider range of styles at better price points. As a result, our sales revenue rose dramatically, and we continued to invest with confidence in our U.S.-based product innovation programs that we believe offered significant growth potential. Incidentally, this occurred at the time of a recession, and the positive effects certainly helped to secure American jobs in our U.S. facilities. I thought it might also be instructive to the committee to share with you one recent example of how the high footwear tariffs actually hampered the introduction of a new technology into the U.S. market. In late 2012, shortly after the MTBs expired, Gore unveiled Gore-Tex Surround technology. This is a new footwear innovation platform that we have been heavily investing in for years. With this innovation, we extended the breathable functionality of our footwear to include the sole of the shoe, dramatically increasing performance. The technology can be applied to a wide range of nearly every type of footwear that we, that we work with today on the market. For new and innovative products, the upfront costs to produce and sell are typically much higher than for more established products. Our launch of this new technology co coincided with the expiration of the MTBs and the resulting duties of 20 to 37.5% essentially priced this technology out of the market. As a result, this innovation was introduced only to the European and Asian markets by non-US brands, which allowed these brands effectively a first-to-market advantage. While US footwear brands have since introduced the technology, they still have some catching up to do with their international competitors. And because of this lag, U.S. consumers still experience a limited choice of product featuring a technology developed by an American company. The MTB is a critical and effective tool for manufacturers like us to seek duty relief on high-value products. We are supportive of the new proposed MTB process because for Gore, MTBs have directly incentivized our investments in new and innovative technology, they've helped secure American jobs, and they've increased our global competitiveness. The MTB also helps ensure that the U.S. consumer can continue to enjoy their favorite outdoor activity while remaining comfortable and well-protected from the elements. Thanks for considering my remarks here today. Thank you all for your testimony, and uh, the people on the panel here will have, members will have questions, and reminder to the members that we'll hold uh, everyone to three minutes. Um, so the testimony, uh, of course, I think that everybody uh, listened to and, and uh, um, I was very interested in, in hearing how this really made it clear to me uh, that American families are really the ones who ultimately pay the price on, on the, these uh, as a result of these tariffs. And uh, regardless, though, whether these tariffs are on uh, imports uh, or inputs used in manufacturing or on the products that they buy in the stores, uh, the customer ends up paying the bottom line. So, Mr. Schreiner, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we like to consider ourselves to be the outdoor enthusiasts that you described in, in your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a great story of how the MTB impacts your business and how it impacts your customer. And I was just wondering if you could just go into that in a little more depth on how MTB would benefit your consumers and uh, reduce prices on store shelves, even when duties are suspended on inputs, uh, components, or semi-finished products. Sure, uh, Chairman Riker, in fact, two customers uh, of ours are based in the Pacific Northwest, Brooks Sports, as well as uh, Nike. Um, so we, we enjoy nice business with both of those yeah. uh, world-class footwear organizations. Um, to add our technology to a shoe uh, generally, 
affects uh, the consumer at about a, requires about a $15 to $25 upcharge, depending upon how it's incorporated into the finished shoe. Um, the tariffs, 37.5% tariff on that can add anywhere from an additional $12 to $17. So it's, it becomes a, a pretty dramatic uh, and what we believe an onerous tax to the end consumer uh, purely to, to provide the, uh, uh, to pay the tariff back to uh, Treasury. Um, so obviously what that does for us as a high value component brand is it limits sometimes the, um, the range of product that we can be found in at retail. Uh, it forces some of our customers to down select to less expensive technologies that don't originate in the U.S., uh, despecifying Gore-Tex, for example, uh, for a much less expensive alternative that may be sourced somewhere closer to the, to the point of footwear assembly uh, offshore in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, obviously, that affects our, uh, our business, and it affects our ability to um, manufacture the membranes, which are essential components for this finished footwear. Thank you. Mr. Rangel. Thank you. It's a real comfort for us to be doing something where the witnesses are pleased that we're helping to improve uh, competition with U.S. firms. Uh, Mr. Obink, I understand that your subdivision, some umbrellas, having a 65 or 70 percent clearance on fabric, but I don't see anything that those of us from urban communities could use it for. You, yeah, well, in terms of in terms of use of the fabric, I don't know anything that's seventy percent discounted. I'm interested in, but I have no clue as to what some umbrella would do for an urban dweller. Yeah, when you mentioned a seventy percent discount, what I read someplace that uh, you're having a clearance sale on all your stuff there at Umbrella. You better check it out back home. <laughs> we, we, I'm glad that we, we're about value add. We hope we're not discounting, but uh, so I don't know where you saw that. We need to we need to look into that okay. for sure. We welcome the Mexican jobs coming back to the United States. We appreciate it uh, for Ford Chemical. I'm glad that you recovered from that severe fire that uh, you've suffered, and you're back in business and competitive. And that shoe technology is that just for. Hunting outdoor shoes or uh, dress and casual shoes? Is that on the market already? Dress and casual as well. Is it online? Oh, yeah, you can find it online for sure. Your you dress can. shoes. Thank you for your testimony. we like to be partners with you and your success. Thank you very much. Deal back. Ms. Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panel. According to a case study by the National Association of Manufacturers, the Bayer facility located in Kansas City, which is just miles from my district, employs about 625 people, the majority of which are involved in the manufacturing, handling, and sales of ag crop production products containing imported materials. Bayer in Kansas City also supports upstream local suppliers of goods and services, and for every imported material utilized, it's estimated that seven to eight locally sourced raw materials and packaging goods are consumed. These advanced crop production products produced in Kansas City help ensure high quality, high yield crops that provide affordable nutrition and clothing for people in the U.S. and around the entire world. As part of a multinational corporation, the Kansas City site is in competition with Bayer's foreign locations and third-party manufacturing for new and expanded capacity investment. Considering most foreign manufacturing locations operate in a duty-free environment, the miscellaneous tariffs bill will help Bayer in Kansas City remain a competitive option for creating and keeping manufacturing jobs in the United States. But let's not forget that the MTB will also help much smaller businesses stay globally competitive. In 2010, Kansas Global conducted a survey of member companies in 10 counties located in South Central Kansas and found that approving the MTB would have provided approximately $3 million in savings over a two-year period. Now, some of these companies are larger companies, but most are like Ken Gephardt's Celeste Air, which is the only domestic seller of analog navigational equipment in the U.S. 
Celestair is a three-person company that averages about $800,000 in annual sales, but more than half of those sales come from exports. Getting the MTB approved will help Kin compete against companies in Japan and Germany. Approving the miscellaneous tariffs bill will help manufacturers in the U.S. and will help create and save jobs, and I am excited that we're finally moving forward with this, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mastani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate this hearing. Uh, I want to thank you all for your very compelling evidence you've given us for why we need to do this. And it's high time that we act and move forward. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We've got a bill, and hopefully we will get this done. Uh, we are way behind in getting you relief. I, I was really interested in the, the, the uh, family business angle on this and, and your stories about companies, you know, homegrown, family-owned, multiple generations. It's really, that's, that's the country we want to see continue. And, uh, and Ms. DiDomenico, your, your testimony with regard to the chemical industry is very compelling to me, particularly because in my, my home state, Louisiana, we have a very robust chemical, petrochemical, and plastics industry. And this, indeed, is extremely important to us there. In fact, I think in Louisiana in the petrochemicals production uh, uh, category, we're, we're, we rank second nationwide. Uh, for, the, for our companies to be able to grow, expand, create jobs, export now with new export opportunities uh, arising, uh, getting this MTB issue fixed and taken care of is critically important. So I, I want to, again, thank you. And of course, with Gore, I, I'm very familiar with products in a different uh, product line uh, than what you, you've taken care of for the most part uh, on the medical side. And, uh, you know, I certainly want to, that's, your company has been one of the bright spots in American <laughs> innovation over time. And so we want to ensure that you continue to innovate and have all the inputs necessary to do so. Thank you. So I, I don't really have any particular questions. I just want to thank you all for being persistent, for being patient with Congress. Th sometimes things move very, very slowly. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and your leadership on this, Mr. T. Berry's leadership, Mr. Rangel, uh, for moving this forward. And I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. I appreciate uh, your expertise and insight uh, on these very important issues. I know uh, representing agriculture, uh, agriculture producers have really uh, suffered, I think, a lot of the, the brunt of, of some upside-down policy, if that's the right term. Uh, and, I, and I am encouraged that we, we have a path forward. Uh, Mr. Schreiner, um, not only do I represent agriculture, but uh, uh, some retail as well, a, a fairly well-known retailer named Cabela's, and I know that they uh, have uh, your products, uh, and we know that addressing the problems that we're facing will actually add some value, and I think that that's good uh, for uh, our economy in general. Can you explain a little bit uh, how, uh, how that might, uh, might be carried out? Sure, I'd be happy to, uh, Congressman Smith. Uh, Cabela's is a, both a very important customer of ours and in the value chain, they're a very important retailer for many of our customers. You see, we sell directly in some cases to retail brands like Cabela's who make their own Cabela's branded apparel and footwear, but we also sell to a number of the, uh, the primary hunting brands that sell through that retail channel. So as a, as a customer, uh, Cabela's obviously would benefit from the miscellaneous tariff bill because they would be able to continue to source, uh, bring products in that can only be manufactured for the most part offshore for the type of footwear that they produce. Uh, and they would be able to offer those products at a more reasonable price point for their consumer. And they would be able to specify higher technology in those products, which they might not be able to afford to do when the tariffs are in place. And the same benefits would accrue as well to the brands that sell through Cabela's as a retailer. So we work uh, very closely with Cabela's on, on a number of levels. And uh, uh, I haven't talked to them specifically about their position on this, but I would be willing to bet that they as well would be extremely supportive of the miscellaneous tariff bill. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Kind, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for uh, holding this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony today. Ms. Grove, um, let, me, let me ask you, and, uh, and, and I want you to think about this answer very uh, carefully before you uh, give us a response, but can you reassure our committee today that 
Jordan Spieth was not using a ping club when he shot number 12 at Augusta last Sunday? Did you see that our player Lee Westwood actually won second place? He came very close, and Bubba Watson has won two of the last four that's, Masters tournaments. But um, we, we really felt for Jordan Spieth. He's an excellent player. We're really, really sad for him having a, a tough moment. He did. Do you want to call out any competitors club at this time? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Let me ask the panel just generally, just a couple of generic questions. Are, are you, the only way this is going to work, obviously politically, is if we're not supplanting or replacing any domestic product line that's available. That's one of the criteria to moving forward with the ITC request. Are you aware, have you seen an instance where a certain product was manufactured as a result of the absence of it being in the United States because of the MTP, M MTB barrier that existed? where a company saw a need, uh, high tariffs, and decided to make something here domestically as a consequence? You're not aware of any instance off the top of your head? Well, let me ask you all, has your company felt any pressure to possibly move a product line to another country in order to avoid the uh, MTB uh, tariffs? I see a couple of heads uh, nodding. Yeah. Is We've got a, a global platform. And so, um, you know, we feel, we feel the pressure to move product lines from the U.S., um, but we're committed here. As I said before, 75% of our associates are here. You know, it's where our company was founded. We have a huge commitment here um, in infrastructure. Uh, it's the largest market, most important market. And so we're, we're obviously resisting those temptations. Um, and quite frankly, we're paying the penalty. I mean, we continue to invest here. We've had three significant uh, capital uh, projects this past year. We just pushed away from the docks on a, uh, on a 20 plus million dollar CapEx spend uh, that will benefit North Carolina. So we continue to pay that price, but we just imagine what the level of investment that we could be making if we weren't having to pay the duties. That's right, yeah. Ms. Grove, did you nod your head as well? Yes, that really is an issue that we could make it cheaper somewhere else and not have to pay this um, accelerated uh, amount for the completed, for the component part as opposed to the completed product. I wanna to say too that the ITC is very thorough in the way it vets. I remember with the golf bag flats that at one point they said they weren't going to do the MTB because there was a supplier of those flats in the US. And I said, please tell me who that is. And they said, well, no, it's an anonymous process. And I was worried about it at first, but we eventually found out that it was a sales guy in Georgia who was representing a company that made them in China. So once we figured that out and realized, no, there really was no domestic production, we moved on. But it's, it's a very thorough process. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank everyone for being here as well today. Um, this is an, an issue that is really essential to American manufacturing, which is what your testimony has been so compelling. Uh, to hear, as well as in my home state of Minnesota, but I do remember being in Arizona just a few years ago and hearing the Ping story and this issue was raised about when are we going to have action on this issue from a, a real American success story. And so it's great to hear your testimony here again today. And so we've heard the statistics, you've all shared them, but it really does bear repeating, uh, Mr. Chairman, because if you think about since the last MTB bill expired, uh, back just a few years ago, we've seen another $748 million in higher taxes for American domestic manufacturing. Uh, you have American manufacturers every year have now had an almost $2 billion hit to our economy because of this. And the MTB package, uh, package back in 2010, it was found to support, as was mentioned, 90,000 jobs right here in the United States, um, increased production of $4.6 billion, and expanded our economy by about $3.5 billion. These are significant numbers, and it's a pretty good bang for your buck. If you think about it, thousands of jobs, billions of dollars going into the economy for a few million dollars in lower tariffs. Uh, it doesn't impact any other negatively, any other American uh, manufacturer, domestic importer. And a perfect example in Minnesota is a company called Knitcraft, um, domestic sweater manufacturer. Uh, they're in Minnesota. They used to buy the wrinkle-free, specialized, mercerized cotton that it needs to make uh, its sweaters from American producers. But eventually higher costs and overseas competition drove the U.S. cotton producers uh, out of business, so they didn't have that source in the market. So Knitcraft was forced to turn to an Italian supplier to get the inputs needed to manufacture and then sell their sweaters. Uh, but of course, that came at a price, 
higher tariffs, of course, on those inputs. And they got hit twice. They got hit once by the inputs on the tariffs on the cotton they imported from Italy, and they also got hit on new tariffs on their sweaters that they sold in Canada. And so when Knitcraft was sourcing their cotton from the United States, their sweaters did not face a tariff in Canada due to trade agreements between the two countries. But when the inputs started coming in from Italy, the company lost the duty-free treatment of their products north of the border. So I'm really encouraged by today's hearing. I have one quick question I want to ask the panel, and maybe just a couple can respond quickly. Um, I understand that the tariffs on certain finished goods are lower than the tariffs on inputs needed to manufacture uh, needed to manufacture these finished goods. And we already heard the ping story, but anyone else? How does how how does that put our manufacturers at a competitive disadvantage? And how do MTBs help to counteract this competitive disadvantage? Because you're again higher tariff on on uh, on your finished good versus a lower tariff on the input. Anyone? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a, a good perspective on that, unfortunately, at this stage, Mr. Paulson, I apologize. Okay. But I can say, um, in your state, we work very closely with one of the, the major manufacturers in your state, 3M, with their Thinsulate right. insulation, right? right? And uh, like us, uh, 3M brings a lot of their innovation, and a lot of that process occurs in their labs and in their facilities in, in uh, St. Paul. So they, uh, I think, for competitive reasons, they source and, and do some of their manufacturing for certain um, higher volume commodity products offshore. But I would argue, similar to us, the, um, a lot of the jobs that are created in building that high value content into those products is uh, a lot of people in, in St. Paul. Thank the gentleman. His time has expired. Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm supportive of this initiative uh, and have been. But let me just use a few minutes of my, my allotted time to call attention to something I think is fairly consistent here now. And there's frequently the complaint from our friends, and I do mean our friends on the other side, about the tyrant at the White House who is uh, always usurping congressional authority, but he usurps it because there's not even a fight. And I've opposed expanding authority for the executive, regardless of who sits in the chair. So we now have the line item veto, balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, and we now have to ask for water resources reform and development. We have a moratorium on earmarking. And to get around all of this, we come up with these arguments to artificially get us to where we are today. Now, we all support what these people have done. It's terrific. But the way we're doing this, as opposed to the way we used to do it, we're surrendering our institutional prerogatives and responsibilities. And I've seen it happen time and again, and then in the next breath complain about the executive who takes our authority. There is a good reason that Congress is mentioned as the first branch of government, and it's actually to oversee the executive. So here, in order to get past this kind of, once again, a chicanery, we decide that we're going to come up with this artificial mechanism to accomplish an end for good people who now have waited a long time to see this happen, when this could have been done the way it was once done in Congress through what we call the regular order. So I support the legislation. It's a benefit to our manufacturers. These are all nice stories that everybody told today. But I want to tell you, at some point, the executive does become all-powerful because the legislative branch doesn't stand up for its institutional responsibilities and prerogatives. And I think there's a profound inconsistency with what we do. So to our panelists, how long have you waited for this legislation to be passed? 2012. I mean, we were obviously hugely disappointed when it uh, expired. I mean, it was very impactful on us then from a planning perspective. So we've certainly been. So four years. Yes. Ma'am? Uh, on the golf bag flats, it's been just those few years. But on the golf clubs, we haven't had that relief yet. So we proposed it. But at the time we proposed it and got the whole golf industry involved and happy to say, you know, came up with something that worked, it, the MTB wasn't being considered anymore. Okay. So we've waited for decades. Decades. Yeah, we've also been waiting four years and we've been here every year asking for this bill to pass. Yeah, similar. Uh, in, in prior to 2012, the, the uncertainty of it consumes an awful lot of customer conversations when we could be talking about more 
productive things about how to drive more innovation, how to create more jobs. Mr. Chairman, there's a time when this would have moved through the Congress on a bipartisan basis without having to resort to the gimmickry that we have now to get around promises that were perhaps ill-considered when they were made. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I've, I've just been here um, about 11 years, and uh, even I remember those, those days. So I just look I've, like I've been in Congress 40 years. It's, uh, I had a career <laughs> before this. Um, but also point out that uh, I, I just became the chairman in December. Look where we are today, Mr. Neal. Would the gentleman yield? <laughs> I'll you yield. can undo it right now, and we'll make like we didn't even notice. <laughs> Well, I know that Mr. Neal and, uh, and folks on his side of the aisle uh, recognize that there are some of us on, on the Republican side of the aisle that agree wholeheartedly with, uh, with the uh, views that he's just expressed. Um, and some of us have been vocal about that. And the ne next gentleman that you're about to hear from, Mr. Kelly, I know is in that group too. So Mr. Kelly, you're recognized. I hope, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. But I want right. to thank all of you for being here. You know, so much of what we talk about uh, when we're in session is policy. But what we don't talk about is the people that the policy affects. So you showing up, you are the face of what it is that we have to address. And it's not just some kind of an ideolo ideological discussion or, or a debate. It's about how we're harming you in a way that makes you uncompetitive in a global economy. And so every one of you, and I just, I was looking through it, uh, Mr. Roma, you, you talk about Sumbrella and the fact that you can no longer buy the fabric you need because it's not, you can't buy it statewide because it's not produced statewide, right? So you have to get it from outside. That is correct. Uh, and, and Mr. Domenico, you talk about uh, Dianel, right? Uh, and I mean, this is stuff that you use these things to make colors. So is this Dianel only available in, in, from certain sources? Yes, there's only a few sources and they're all overseas. They're all overseas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we go to Gore-Tex, and you know, what you talked about, uh, I was trying to understand, and maybe you can help me on this. You talked about a versatile polymer called EPTFE. I have absolutely, I, I see it's, it's kind of bracketed to what it is, but I won't even try to say it. Where do you have to get that material? That, that material uh, is produced domestically. It's, it is produced domestically? Yes. Okay. And, and the, Ms. Grove, the, the on, on the stocks, the feedstocks for that material as yeah. well are produced domestically. And, and Ms. Grove, your, your company produces golf clubs, but you're in a global economy. We're all fighting for the same thing. Uh, I'm an automobile dealer. And on the side of every uh, new car is, is what they call a Moroni label, but also on the Moroni label, in addition to each item, and by the way, this, the cost on any particular car is the same no matter whether you buy it in Detroit where it's produced or where you buy it in Miami. It's the same price. They've equalized the pricing on it. But also, in addition to that, is the content of how these products are made. It is the end product. Now, there's a lot of people that make small things that go into the end product of a big, that you put out in the market. And I think what we're trying to get to is, why would your own government make it harder for you to be successful? Especially when all the revenue we derive is from people who are successful. It just doesn't fit. And I'm not sure I understand. Maybe, Mr. New, you've been here a lot longer than me. Mr. Rangel, you have too. And, and Sheriff, you and I have been together here for a couple of years. I'm just trying to think. So if you really wanted to make yourself globally competitive and you wanted to be on the shelf at the same price as other people and you wanted to be able to build buildings and you wanted to be able to invest in equipment and you wanted to be able to hire people and train people and provide all these wonderful revenues, we have to make you equal, at least be on a level playing field. Why would we make it harder for you. And so I'm with you, Mr. I mean, I'm, it's just bizarre. So the people we, we rely on for all the revenue, we're going to make it harder for them to be successful, and then we're hold, going to hold them accountable for wanting to leave. I, it doesn't make sense. Listen, I'm out of time, but I think also, not only am I out of time, you're out of time too. You need a government that's going to respond to make sure that you can compete globally. And if we think this is a problem, or we can't get through this because it has some kind of political implication, I would just say it too often, politics interfere with policy that's good for people. Thank you all for being here. You are the face of America, and you are the face of people who provide every single penny that this government uses to provide all these wonderful services to folks. So thanks so much, Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. We always let Mr. Kelly go a few minutes extra. <laughs> Mr. T. Berry, do you have? Yeah, comments? thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this. And Mr. Neal, you're starting to convince me on, on some of these issues. I will yield. It's been a long haul. <laughs> but, 
I want to challenge your, your narrative here on one issue. So if we hadn't given up our authority on earmarks, I still doubt that that would have had any impact on this administration on the overtime rules that I just met with a group of small businesses on, or the fiduciary rule, which you are quite familiar with, or the power plant rules, or the immigration rules, or the EPA rules, or the waters of the USA rules. Right. And I could go on. So I don't know that that would have stopped them from doing what they're doing, which the, the is gentleman yield. an ex Yes, I would go ahead. There was a slow encroachment of executive authority that dates to the founding of the country. And every Agreed. time that we forfeit the responsibility, they take more. But in this instance here, in the cases, by the way, you've, excited, uh, you've uh, used as an example on the DOL rule, I was willing to challenge my own administration. Yes, you were one of the few. We need to do that from time to time. I agree. I mean, that's I agree. congressional authority. So, Ms. DiDomenico, uh, you clearly understand, based upon your testimony, the challenges that um, we have had here internally in dealing with this rule. But we also have, and I think this would be a bipartisan, uh, but there would be bipartisan agreement, uh, that even within this own body, there, there is a lot of misunderstanding of what an MTB is, including a notion that cuts on, on businesses like th those of you who are here today uh, on these tariffs, or tax cuts on, on American business essentially, somehow will increase congressional spending. And some believe that this is also an earmark. Can you, can you in layman's terms, expand upon your testimony and tell members of Congress for the record why that's, why you may not believe that? Yeah, yeah by, um, by the money that we would save on these duties, we'd be able to employ one or two more people just for one raw material alone. Then you compound that for all the other raw materials that we're purchasing, and we could employ many more people, invest back in our company, and that money through income, income taxes and other ways would go back to the government. So to say the government is lost, losing out on revenue, I don't, think, I don't think that's a true statement. And to say that it's an earmark, we don't think that's the case because although one company may submit the MTB, there could be several other manufacturers that are using that same product. So we also don't feel that it's an earmark. Thanks so much. Uh, my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Holding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and I want to thank the subcommittee staff working hard to come up with the MTB that we're here to talk about today. You know, this particular issue, the MTB issue, is one of the principal reasons that I sought to join the Ways and Means Committee and become the first Republican in 30 years from North Carolina to serve on the Ways and Means Committee. Um, it's an important issue for North Carolina. And, um, you know, Glenn Raven, Mr. Omeg, the, um, the CEO of Glenn Raven, uh, is an honor for me to have you all here today. You know, North, Glen Raven's a North Carolina institution. And Mr. Chairman, I'd point out that this is a 130-year-old American textile company. The, um, you know, textiles have taken hits over the years, but it's companies like Glen Raven and the family behind Glen Raven um, that have embraced innovation um, and made the commitment and sacrifices uh, that ultimately are paying off today with a thriving um, company. Um, so, Mr. I'll make a quick question to you. I understand Glenn Raven has recently announced some exciting changes and in investments in your Sunbrella design and manufacturing operations in North and South Carolina. So, if you could just share briefly uh, a few more details about this and how an MTB would support and enhance these efforts. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Um, as mentioned earlier, I mean, we have continued to invest heavily in Sunbrella, uh, even in, uh, despite uh, paying the tariffs. Um, it's the growth engine for our business. Uh, we have a thriving textile industry in the U.S., but it's, it's driven by innovation and product differentiation and really continuing to separate ourselves. And so for us, uh, in the U.S., I mean, we continue to invest in assets. Uh, we continue to, uh, to expand our manufacturing capabilities. We recently realigned one of our plants in western North Carolina in, a, in a, an area that, that badly needs the employment. Uh, we saved 175 jobs there, uh, aligning that with, the, with the, uh, the growth engine of our business being Sunbrella. So we are certainly expanding there. 
And we have some of the uh, most well-known furniture designers and fabric designers from around the world that are now coming to North Carolina because they want exclusive designs and they want to collaborate with us on their design activities. And so we, in order to do that, uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, um, announced an investment that we're, that we're executing now of more than $20 million to create a design center that will be you know, a source of pride for North Carolina and obviously a, um, a source of opportunity for job creation um, as we're bringing in uh, customers and prospective customers from around the world. Thank you. I thank, uh, thank you all for your, your testimony um, and for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to be here. And I, I want to just uh, end on this note, uh, Mrs. Graves. I appreciate your comment about the thoroughness of ITC. I think that's one question that some members have come to me uh, about. Uh, I think it's, it's great to hear from the private sector as to you know, what your, at least your opinion is of that, uh, of that process. And as we look at this piece of legislation, recognizing that the process begins with the private sector coming to ITC with a request, a review and analysis occurring, Recommendations then being made by ITC to Congress through the Ways and Means Committee, another review process by uh, the chairman and, and the committee members um, can't add to that recommendation but can subtract to it. Adding to would, would then, uh, of course, in, uh, kind of enact the uh, um, earmark rule. So we can't do that. Uh, and then it goes to the floor for a vote. And the Senate, of course, through their rules on their side uh, of the legislative body in processing legislation would go through a similar process. So the final, to Mr. Neal's point um, that he was making earlier, I understood what he was trying to say, but the final say uh, is, is held in the hands of Congress, not in the, in the hands of the president. The, the review process, the, the public presentation, of the ITC recommendation uh, sits right here in the Ways and Means Committee, and that process starts with the chairman uh, sharing that, that uh, information with the public and then moving forward with legislation. So uh, appreciate everyone's uh, participation today, and again, thank you so much for your testimony, and look forward to next week's markup and a, and a vote soon. This hearing is adjourned.